Hey guys, what's up? It's Clay. Welcome to another video. Today I want to talk about INFJs and relationships. So a few days ago, I went and rewatched my very first INFJ video that I did. It was about nine months ago. It was called Being an INFJ. And so that was kind of the first video I did on this topic. This video, I kind of want to follow up on that and try to give more kind of stories from my own life, uh, but more with regards to relationships. So this could be relationships, any kind of relationship. It could be like romantic relationships, friendships, you know, family relationships. So I don't just mean romantic relationships when I say relationships. I guess I want to give more anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal is things that are not peer-reviewed research. So it's kind of just a lot of my own opinions. So I think most of the things that I said in that video were correct and accurate. I did start off the video, if you've seen it, with a bit of a disclaimer. I'm not one of those people that kind of takes this as biblical truth, like everybody and everything must fit into this model. I kind of look at this whole Myers-Briggs socionics system as a model, exactly that. So here's a model that kind of tries to explain people's behavior. And for the most part, I actually find it really valuable and quite accurate. And I find that a lot of people do fit into this model and it helps explain a lot of people. I know the INFJ personality was a big deal to me when I, when I found it because it explained a lot of my behavior. Um, it gave me a level of comfort that I wasn't alone, I guess, in the world. Like there's other people that actually behave this way. There's a bit of method to my madness, I guess you could say. And the, uh, probably the most common comment on that other being an INFJ video is pretty much that. A lot of people like, but pretty much say, you know, I thought I was alone. I can't believe that I just found somebody else who thinks like I do. There's a lot of that on there. And it seems to be, with INFJs anyway, it seems to be a running theme that we feel quite alone, I think, in the world. Quite misunderstood. Um, we don't really know what we're doing half the time. So one thing I feel like I've learned since I made that video is I think it is actually a lot more complicated than I even thought in the first place. And I think, in particular, it can be very difficult sometimes to type people. And so I have a bunch of evidence in my own life. So in that video, I might have actually said that I had a couple or a few INFJ friends at the time. And it's really funny because I now feel like it's possible that all or most of those INFJ friends aren't actually INFJs. And it has taken me years of knowing them to even get to know them on a deep enough level to even say that. And I think the thing about this personality stuff is if you're a healthy person, you can kind of like cohabitate all four sides of your mind at the same time and you kind of strike this healthy balance. So your core personality might be, let's say, INFJ, but then there's all the things that you've learned, you know, all the cultural programming you've received as you've, as you've grown up and, and you have weaknesses and you've worked on those weaknesses and it's possible that something that was a weakness, you've worked on it really hard and now you're pretty good at it. You're not even that weak in it. So the thing that I want to kind of impart in people is that just because you are an INFJ does not mean that you are this cookie cutter thing or any other personality for that matter, ENFP. I actually lately have been realizing that I have more ENFPs around me than I realized. So one of my friends that I, she actually had gotten INFJ on the multiple tests and she always maintained that she was INFJ. But I just, it never really fit. At this point, I'm like 99% sure that she's an ENFP. I had another friend, a male friend, who he wasn't really sure what he had got. He did the test again, he got INFJ. In the end, he's an ENFP too, uh, pretty sure. So my other friend, probably my closest friend, to be honest, she's still a bit of an enigma to me. She behaves a lot like an INFJ, but then at times, you know, there's these INFP traits that come out and I, it's confusing. So the explanation for this, I think, isn't that the model itself is incorrect. I think what it is, is that we have these core personalities, which would be our nature, let's say. Let's say we were, I mean, it's debated in psychology. Are you born with a personality or is that, you know, learned? I think a lot of people believe that you're kind of born with something. Uh, let's call that your nature. So let's say that's your 
your raw personality with nothing infiltrating it at that point. And then as you grow up, that's your nurture. All the things that you learn, all the things that you're taught, and then all the insecurities that are piled upon you, maybe various abuse that you undergo as a child. And in the end, you're this person. It's kind of this mixture of nature and nurture. And I think because of that, you're trying to almost type somebody's nature, but you've got this nurture over top that is kind of clouding it sometimes. I think it's harder to type people than it seems like sometimes. And it's more the deep people, I should say. You know, sometimes it can be really quick and easy actually to type people, especially if you use the cognitive functions to type people. You know, if you can really notice somebody's dominant function pretty easily sometimes just by the way they interact. Or so if somebody has an obvious blind spot, usually that can go into, you know, typing them as well. But one thing that I think is funny is on that being an INFJ video, a lot of people, I mean, I would say 99% of the comments are quite positive, which is amazing for YouTube because YouTube is generally pretty negative. And once in a while, I'll get people commenting that I'm not an INFJ. It's interesting, those people don't usually give reasons, which I kind of find suspicious. So if somebody actually feels that I'm not an INFJ and that I don't fit that model, I would actually like to hear their reasons why. A lot of times people don't give their reasons. They just say, this guy is not an INFJ, he's a fraud or something like this. I think the thing that I wanted to say is that these people really have no idea about me. Um, I, you can't watch a video of somebody and really get to know them. The reality is I've spent quite a few years in sales and I actually have learned how to project myself. So on, the, on a video like this, I'm projecting a certain thing. So I think it's really almost comical when somebody comes on, watches a video of me, and then usually I can tell they didn't actually watch the whole video and then they can throw out this antidote that I am not an INFJ. And why is it that people do that? I think one of the things I've noticed about people when they type themselves is they start to look, they look at themselves, I am an INFJ. And then when they see somebody else that is different from them, that is also an INFJ, it rubs them the wrong way. Because I think what they wanna see is they wanna see themselves in somebody else. But I think this all goes back to that nature and nurture thing before. People start to almost assign qualities that have nothing to do with the personality to the personality. So one example is somebody came on one time and said, you're much too masculine to be an INFJ. And then on the contrary, I actually had somebody come on and say, you're too feminine to be an INFJ. So I think these two comments kind of illustrate, I think one of the, one of the biggest misconceptions about this personality stuff is something like masculine and feminine it really has nothing to do with the personality. You could be a man, you can be a woman, you could be a feminine man, you could be a masculine woman. Let's just say there's a guy out there who's an INFJ and he's a little bit more feminine. He then assumes because he is that way that if there's a guy out there that is more masculine, let's say, that that guy's not an INFJ. I think in a lot of ways, I have certain feminine qualities that not a lot of guys do. And so a lot of guys, they don't want to have the kind of discussions that I want to have. And I think it's oftentimes why I end up with a lot of female friends, because it seems like for whatever reason, women are more open about things like feelings and you know, intimacy and stuff like this. All these various topics that I like to talk about. Check out all my other videos if you want to see. And a lot of men, I think, are a little bit scared almost to talk about some of this stuff. And it's kind of funny. Like, I read this article one time, and it was like, the difference between men and women in a relationship. And as I'm reading through, I'm going, man, I identify with the woman in, in this article. And the relationship I was in at the time, she was the man in this article. And it actually happened on a podcast recently as well. I was listening to a James Altucher podcast and he had this guest on there and she had written a book and it was all about women and all these things that women are like and women. That, and so I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, I was like, why is this book written about women? I feel like I identify with almost every one of these points. So I guess what I'm trying to say is don't get too caught up on things like that. So I think where the personality profiles really shine is sort of explain how you relate to the world. How do you gather information? How do you express information? How do you relate to the people around you? All right, so let's jump into it a little bit here. I want to talk about relationships and how I relate to people, how I respond to people in certain situations. 
um, what people seem to think about me. And I want to kind of all relate it back to this INFJ stuff. I've had a pretty intense couple years, I guess, to say the least. I don't talk about it on here with my personal life, but I've had a lot of changes occur, a lot of conflicts, I guess you could say, with certain people. And I've sort of been sort of coming out of this state that I've been in in my whole life. And sort of almost like, I feel like I'm sort of coming into myself and trying to find myself. One of the things I'm really trying to let go of is arbitrary identities. A lot of people, I think, latch on to identities to almost try to find their value. And so anytime that you might say, I am a X, and anytime you kind of fill in that blank with anything, it could be religious beliefs, like I am a Christian, I am a Muslim, um, I am a Democrat, I am a Republican, um, anything like that. Anytime you take on one of those identities, it's something that I'm trying to shed in a lot of ways. I don't want to have identities that are just sort of like dead weight. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, why? Why is that? Some people are a little confused when I say I don't want identities. A lot of people will try to push identities onto me and I really try to resist that. The reason why is once you take on an identity, it's almost like it's forming your decisions for you and you almost feel pressured to live or answer questions or kind of exist within that box of the identity. So for example, uh, easy example, let's say you're a Democrat and I'm, I'm actually Canadian. We don't actually have Republicans and Democrats, but we're also inundated with USA news all day long. So let's say you're a Democrat and just taking on that identity, you're immediately expected to think in a certain way. So it's exactly the kind of thing that I don't want in my life. So. I am trying to shed identities that I don't need, which is ironic in a way because being an INFJ is an identity that I've kind of taken on for myself. However, I was thinking about it the other day and I think that the reason why I'm okay with this particular identity is that it explains me rather than me explaining it, if that makes sense. It helps me identify certain strengths in myself, certain weaknesses, the way I interact with people and the world. And I, it's almost like a tool to explain something. But at the same time, I think you have to be careful because you never want to use it as an identity. And how do you know you're using it as an identity? If you're using it to almost explain unhealthy behaviors or justify things like, oh, well, I don't need to be good at that because I'm an INFJ. INFJs aren't good at that. So that would be the exact thing I'd want to avoid. So whenever I talk about personality profiles, I still want to take it with a grain of salt so that I'm not locked in. If this thing tells me that I'm supposed to be a certain way because I'm an INFJ and I'm not like that, you have to have the self-awareness to realize that. Because here's the reality. I think that there's a lot of INFJs out there that aren't actually INFJs and I've seen it over and over. Um, I have a few different friends now, three, that have gotten INFJ on the test and after we kind of dig through it and work on it, you know, they end up as other things. INFPs often test as INFJs and ENFPs, which was kind of surprising to me in the, in the first place, um, but there's some similarities there. ENFPs get confused and they think they're INFJ sometimes, or even ISFJs have, uh, I've seen test as INFJ. So I've made all these videos about being an INFJ and it would be kind of embarrassing in a way if all of a sudden I realized that I wasn't one. But at the same time, I don't want to lock myself into that. So as I grow, as I learn more about myself, if I actually discover that maybe I fit into something else, maybe I am something else, and there's just layers of gunk over top that are kind of almost forcing me to behave in a way that is unnatural to myself. Um, you know, it's possible, I guess what I'm trying to say. And I think everybody should take this stuff with a grain of salt and keep an open mind. When you latch onto an identity, I think a lot of people, it closes their mind. So it's really the opposite of what you want. So just as a recap, the key with all this stuff is to use it as a tool Use it as a way to find maybe some comfort that you're not 
crazy. You're not alone in the world. That's what a lot of INFJs find when they <laughs> discover this stuff. So I think a common thread, I mean, I've read a lot of comments from various people who identify as an INFJ. A common thread is, seems like most INFJs don't really feel like they fit into the world super well. We're kind of like outsiders looking in a lot of the time. Um, but when the situation calls for it, we can actually be quite outgoing. We can almost appear extroverted. They call the INFJ the extroverted introvert. Um, some people have called it that. We can be extremely caring, and that's the extroverted feeling. So the second function in the INFJ stack is the extroverted feeling. What that means is you take on other people's feelings and almost you're almost better at feeling for other people before you're even feeling your own feelings, if that makes sense. You're better at feeling other people's feelings. It's actually one of the quickest ways you can tell if you're an INFP versus INFJ. INFJs are kind of almost ruled by their extroverted feeling. So the dominant function is introverted intuition, but the second thing is their extroverted feeling. And a lot of times this function can kind of get run away on an INFJ to the point where you become a people pleaser. You walk into a room, you're immediately trying to make everybody happy. Um, you're more worried about everybody else's well-being. You're worried about giving people good experiences. That's a, a huge part of extroverted feeling. Whereas an introverted feeler, which is an INFP. So when you go from INFJ to INFP, by the way, it's not as simple as just flipping a letter. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I see between when people are trying to decide if they're an ENFJ and an INFJ. So I'm a little more extroverted, I must be an ENFJ. That's not true, that's not how it works. It's actually the cognitive functions you have to look at. So if you wanna know more about the cognitive functions the, and you haven't watched my other video, you might wanna watch that one first, which is the being an INFJ video. I talk about more sort of in depth with the top four cognitive functions. I'll mention them here as well, but that might be a good place to start because I'm gonna kinda talk assuming you've already watched that video. So an INFP, dominant function in an INFP is introverted feeling. And that means INFPs, they really know how they feel. They, like, they know their values. They, they know who they are. ENFPs and INFPs are like that. And INFJs are a little more wishy-washy in that department. Sometimes we, we know what we want, and that's the introverted intuition. So introverted intuition can really identify what you want what you're working towards, um, like a plan or a goal, really can lock onto that and almost like laser focus in on that and work towards that almost with blinders up. The introverted feeling is a little different. It's more about how knowing your own feelings, your values. And I've noticed that INFPs, they're more solid, at least how I view them. They're more solid, they're, it's harder to sway them and make them question their own being, I guess you could say. I find it quite easy for people to make me question myself, like people that are manipulative. So I've gotten a lot better at this in the last couple years, um, but I think for a lot of years I was a massive people pleaser. I didn't even know myself. The, the introverted feeling thing feels quite foreign to me, but both ENFPs and INFPs are really good at knowing their feelings. So that's one way you can tell. A lot of INFJs I've noticed, they almost feel like they're on the outside looking in. And although they can fit in and almost learn to fit in and act a certain way, and we can kind of become like chameleons. We can kind of fit into whatever group we're hanging out with. And even though we're like that, there's still this feeling like I don't fit in here. What I've noticed as an INFJ, is that as I become more like myself and allow more of myself out, have more confidence to share my opinions, share my ideas, that a lot of people, it's like they just look at me like I'm some kind of alien, is, is the truth. A lot of people are extremely thrown off by me. So I made a video a while ago, it was one of my first videos, even before the INFJ video, it's it this analogy with the birds and the fish. I was identifying that problem then, but basically if I kind of let myself out of my cage, I can freak people out, especially the people that I would classify as birds. And these are the people that they don't wanna get deep, they don't wanna have deep conversations, they don't wanna almost open up and share themselves. They don't really have the same wonderings that I do. Like I wonder a lot of stuff. 
I guess you could say. I notice a lot of things. I see a lot of nonsense all around me. Uh, culture, government. I really notice things that don't make sense. I notice when people don't make sense. I notice when people contradict themselves. I'm kind of almost tortured by that in a lot of ways. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. I've noticed that if I keep myself really simple, keep a lid on it, you know what I'm saying, in social situations with people that I feel like can't really handle the level of depth that is just normal everyday life for me, if I keep myself simple, they're happy and everything appears to go along fine for this relationship that I would then deem as a bit of a shallow relationship. But there's only really so long I can do that for before I just start to get disinterested and bored. And I don't really want to hang out with those people. Like I don't, you know, especially if it's family related, it can get really difficult. Especially if there's these things burning inside of you that you, you want to say like injustices. Or let's say if somebody has some kind of ignorance that you view, like they're just really ignorant towards some social issue or somebody's feelings out there or... And you know you want to talk about it, but you just know it's not a good idea. Like if you hold all these things inside too long, it's like you just don't really want to be around these people. But if you let it out, then they view you as an alien, and they get all freaked out. So it's it's kind of like a catch twenty two, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. So that's why, and I've talked about this in other videos. That's why I think it's really important that we as INFJs find a few really good friends that you can get deep with that you can connect with and feel understood and accepted and basically build emotional intimacy. So I've made a couple videos on intimacy now. Uh, I made one just on emotional intimacy. I made another one called The Five Pillars of Relationships. I think emotional intimacy is the cornerstone of all relationships. And you can't get emotional intimacy unless you share your innermost self and find somebody that you can do that with and feel accepted and understood. So another part about being an INFJ is it's almost like, at least I am, I can't say this for everybody, but I feel like I'm bad at small talk. Like I almost, it's almost agonizing, <laughs> I guess, at certain times. I, I just don't know how to do it. I, I can do it, but it's, it's forced. And I, it's hard every time. Like if there's only so long I can talk about the weather. I can have a short conversation about the weather, but if this goes on for like five, 10 minutes and we're still talking about the weather, I will quickly start looking for some ways to get out of that conversation. So small talk in general is, is something I don't like. But you know, there's other personalities that don't like that as well. So just because you don't like small talk doesn't mean you're an INFJ. But it is something that I think most INFJs just dislike. It feels like there's more important things to talk about. Why don't we talk about that stuff instead? So what am I most attracted to in another person, whether that be a friend, a family member that I want to engage with, or you know, potentially a romantic relationship. The number one thing I think is I need somebody who has interesting perspectives to offer on life. Interesting ideas, different ways of looking at things. So let's say I view a subject on a certain way and somebody else offers me a perspective that I had never thought about. I love perspectives. I love thinking about things from all sides. So if there actually is a perspective that I had never considered before, I really enjoy hearing about it, which is kind of ironic because I've noticed that a lot of other types of people, they hate that. Like once they have their perspective, they have their identity chosen, they don't want to hear those other perspectives anymore. Like the issue's kind of over with. I feel like for me, Issues are never over with. Issues are always open and I'm always welcome to new perspectives. So I really like that, I guess, when a person can offer me new perspectives. So another thing that I really value in relationships as an INFJ is I love it when somebody can talk to me about something without getting defensive. And this has been a massive problem for me in my life and something that uh, I won't get into the details of it, but has caused some huge issues, I guess. It's like you've got Certain people who have their ways of doing things, their beliefs, and I think as long as somebody doesn't impose that on me, I'm totally fine. But as soon as somebody pulls out judgment on me or starts pushing their beliefs on me and almost forcing me or giving me ultimatums or trying to manipulate me, I 
will defend myself, I guess I could say. And I will tell people what I think and why I don't want to do that. But a lot of times these same people are also the people who can't look at things from different perspectives. So if you start to offer up to these people sort of some other ways that they could look at things or maybe start to point out some errors in their logic or some contradictions in things they've pointed out, these people get super defensive. Defensive turns into anger and they might even sort of put even new stipulations on you in the future so this doesn't happen anymore. So another thing I really value in relationships is a deeper connection. A lot of my relationships, that's what I'm looking for now. And if I can't get that in a new relationship at this point, I kind of just, I'll abandon it really before it even gets going so I don't have to deal with that stress later. I think in general, the small talkers are the most confused by me and the most uncomfortable, I guess, when I start to go deep and it's almost like their eyes glaze over and they get almost in a state of fear. I call it the white look. So the white look is sort of that look when somebody sort of reaches that peak terror point. When you have just taken them too deep down into the water, they're a bird and you're a fish and you have just dragged them down into the water, they get this thing that I call the white look. And it's sort of like, it's like a mixture of terror. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I keep an eye out for that white look. Now when I see it, I stop uh, and kind of just let that person breathe a little bit. So I think INFJs with their introverted intuition and extroverted feeling and then mix that with the introverted thinking. We're quite good at spotting manipulation, spotting liars, spotting contradictions, especially spotting contradictory behavior in people. You know, they're saying one thing, but they're doing another thing. And that, that's just like a screwdriver to my brain, to be honest. I can't really handle it when I start to see those contradictions. And I don't know what to do, to be honest. Do I? say it? Do I tell people uh, that doesn't make sense because of this? You know, like you said this yesterday, now you're saying this. That doesn't make sense. I think at my core for a relationship, I need the person to make sense. Sounds so simple, right? But there are so many people that just don't make sense. You're like, why do you, why are you doing that? Why, do you, why are you saying that? Why are you asking that of me? And they don't have an answer. I feel like I need answers. I need people to have reasons for what they're doing and I need it to make sense. Sounds so simple, but it's actually unbelievably hard to find. So I think all INFJs need that. And because of that, I think INFJs can be a little suspicious. I know I am. Um, and it's possibly maybe one of my weaknesses and I might be more suspicious than an average INFJ, but it's, it's crazy how fast I can go down a rabbit hole. It's like, uh-oh, somebody just said this. And it's like, if I don't keep a lid on it, I can start to be like, oh, well, two days ago they said this. And then, uh, you know, I start putting all these puzzle pieces together and going down rabbit holes into conclusions that might not be true. And it, it's sort of something I've noticed with a few different personalities. I, I have an ENFP friend, the one that... Um, maybe thought she was INFJ. And to be honest, I kind of thought she might be an INFJ for a while too, but I think that personality is also really prone to overthinking. So overthinking is just any time that you just, you get into this loop and you just are ruminating on something that really you should let go and you should go find some more information instead of just trying to solve something in your head that might not be solvable without some new input. So yeah, people that contradict themselves, people that are shifty, I, I pick up on that so quickly and I don't like to be around those types of people. And at this point in my life, whatever, I, I got no problem saying that I don't wanna be around somebody because I think they're liars. I don't like liars. I don't like shifty people. I don't like manipulative people. You know, go watch my videos on manipulation if you want more about that. So I've studied manipulation techniques quite a bit now as soon as somebody pulls one of those out on me, like, I am out. I'm out the door. Part of the problem with a lot of this stuff is, as you learn to recognize it, you kind of end up with a smaller crew. And I, th I think that's okay. You might not have this big crew of people 
that really get you. You don't have a ton of friends, but hopefully, you know, if you act authentic in that way, you can get a few friends that can become very close. That's what I'm looking for. So you may have heard the term INFJ door slam, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that and what I think sort of creates the conditions for that to happen. So in a lot of ways, the INFJ door slam, I, I hear that INFPs can also do this as well. So I, I don't think it's just an INFJ thing. I think at my core, I really want to engage with people that are close to me. Like people that I actually let into my inner circle, I need that engagement. But sometimes, you know, you have people that are in your life for other reasons, like let's say an old friend, like somebody who's been friends since high school and now, or friends since you were kids and now you've been friends for years and years and years and they're kind of just a friend by default. Or what happens with families or especially families that are quite large and you got aunts and uncles and cousins and or in-laws, you know, let's say you're in a relationship with somebody and you get married. Now you've basically adopted their family into your life. And depending on how close your partner is with their family, these people may be around quite a bit. So I think it's quite common with INFJs to, to work really hard in those situations. We have extroverted feeling sort of ruling us, I like to say. So we want people to feel good. We want to give people a good experience. We want people to like us. Like, I think we can get caught up in that and almost start caring too much. Like we really want people to like us. You know, I hear INFPs also like to be liked. And there's probably lots of persons. I mean, who doesn't like to be liked? I have noticed that certain personalities, it seems like INTJs, they just, I have a couple INFTJ friends and they seem to just be able to completely disconnect from this and they don't really seem to care <laughs> if people like them. Maybe that's an overstatement. But INFJs often are caring too much about what people think, especially when they're unhealthy. Healthy ones probably got it in check. So we're trying to engage with people. We've got, you know, friends and family. Um, like let's say some old friend and you just have this feeling like this person is your best friend, therefore they should behave in a certain way. So we might try really hard in those relationships. We want to fix those things. I know I do. Maybe I shouldn't say we. Um, I want to fix problems in relationships. If there's a problem there, it's almost like I can't think or do anything else until that problem is fixed. And if there's a really big problem, like I can't even like fake it very well, even if I had to fake it, like just for a night, go to a party and like just pretend like everything's fine. I am terrible at that. So the easiest way for me is to deal with issues as they come up. So let's say there's some kind of contention or problem or fight or there, I feel like I'm getting vibes from them, like there's something wrong or they're pulling back. I generally want to take care of that as soon as I can. But what I've noticed and run into is that a lot of people don't want to take care of issues and that might be because of their own personality. They want to close off, so they might want to keep it really light. They, they don't want to expose their insecurities. I think a lot of times that I just naturally see into people and I see these problems, I see these insecurities, I see these issues, I see issues that they might have with me. I might see things that they're doing that I think are manipulative and I need to deal with that, but they don't want that. And so this can go on for quite some time as I try and try and try. And I've heard that this is a thing with INFJs is because we want to seek harmony, like in that relationship, that we will try really hard and for a long time, maybe too long, longer than other people would try. For whatever reason, we just keep trying. And then along with that, this person can almost get used to our trying as like our regular state. So we're trying so hard and breathing into this person and investing and trying to get this thing that we know is in there or trying to fix this problem. And meanwhile, this person might just be kind of lazy about it and going, oh yeah, this is what this, the way this person is. But at the same time, they're not fixing the problem. They are not 
letting us deal with this issue that is just like glaring us in the face. So this can go on for a long, long time until one day we're done with it. We, we, I've noticed that I've, this has happened so many times <laughs> where I try and try and try and then I eventually come to this place where I'm like, this isn't working. That's the introverted intuition. Introverted intuition's quite good at putting together the puzzle and then you come to this conclusion and you're like, this isn't working, this person's not getting it, they're never gonna get it. And then you kind of, you, you've had all these observations and you have all this evidence to suggest that this is never gonna get better, this person will never change, this is never going to work. And it's a dangerous place when an INFJ reaches that conclusion because we're not really people that like to do things halfway we are people that like progress, working towards goals. We like improvement, and we don't like stagnation. Uh, at least I know I don't, and I've heard that other INFJs are similar. We're more like finishers in that we're always trying to push towards this state of improvement. I guess we're improving ourselves. Like I, I'm always on this path to trying to improve myself. And so if all of a sudden I realize that this relationship is never going to change and there's this glaring problem, I can kind of like flip the switch. And so that's the INFJ door slam. All of a sudden, all at once, you're just done. And you just walk away and you stop trying. And this person can be left, you know, extremely confused. They're like, whoa, what happened? They might be used to me behaving in certain ways and now I'm not interested in behaving that way. So I think when that happens, it's actually extremely hard to reverse a door slam. I think quite often when INFJs like break up with a person, that could be a friendship or a romantic partner, it's pretty hard for us to go back. Like there's, I've noticed certain personalities that they're really forgiving and they can easily go back. I could be wrong, but I know with myself, once I've made that decision and I'm moving in a different direction, it is almost impossible even if I want to, like even if I want, oh, I wish I could fix that, but it's too late. The, the, the introverted intuition has spoken and it's not going to work. I'm now moving in a different direction. And I've noticed that the only way for that situation to be solved, for that person to fix it at that point, is they have to almost do a 180 turn and prove to me in a very, concise, clear way that now they get it. And if there's things to apologize for, they need to apologize extremely specifically and very directly for those things to the point where they convince me that now they understand the problem and they are willing to work on it to fix that problem. Because I'm a firm believer that if you don't know what the problem is, you can't fix it. And I think that is where a lot of these INFJ door slams occur, is you realize this person doesn't understand the problem, therefore they can't fix it. They will never understand the problem because of whatever reason. So therefore they will never fix it. So in order for that to be repaired, this person basically has to first recognize the problem and recognize it in a very clear and concise way and then verbalize that to you. There needs to be apologies attached to that where they apologize for that very specific thing and then following from that, there needs to be some kind of a plan on how that is going to be fixed so that it doesn't keep occurring, right? And I think that's why it's so hard to come back from a door slam because for you to even get to that point where you've slammed the door, it's already so unlikely that that person will get it enough to actually fix the problem. So I think it's possible, but just not very probable once it occurs. So following from the whole door slam topic, another thing that I really value in a relationship is somebody who can, is self-aware and can actually see their faults. Like I actually don't even mind having a good argument or fight with a person. Man, I don't like it. Man, I don't like having fights with people. But I think that sometimes it's almost like what needs to happen is Everybody needs to almost remove their filters. Let's, let's say there's a huge problem and it's only like the gloves come off and then you have this argument or fight where everything is laid on the table. I almost appreciate that if 
some kind of conclusion can be reached in the end. Let's say you have a huge problem with a person. Let's say that somebody, there's some behavior that's inappropriate or there, or something, right? And you bring this up to them and you have this big argument about it and they have some issues with you. And in the end, you can actually listen to that person and that person can listen to you and you can come to some kind of understanding to the point where you understand each other a little better. And then at that point, you can both apologize, identify the issues and then apologize for those things and then actually try to make changes to work towards a better future. That to me is just like the pinnacle of a relationship. I think that most people, should I say most? I don't know. A lot of people just aren't, I wanna say mature enough to break things down before they can re be rebuilt. And I, I'm kind of a believer of that in a way that sometimes you need to break it apart in order to rebuild it stronger and with more understanding and acceptance. And a lot of people won't let that breaking down step to happen. They're so closed off and self-protecting and almost defensive, very like people that are super egotistical just can't see fault in themselves, like those types of people. They can't ever get to that stage where it's like, let's just lay it all on the table and then come back together in the end and apologize for the things that need to be apologized. So, you know, my closest relationship in my life right now, I've got, you know, there's multiple examples where we've done that. And I, I gotta say, when you find somebody that can, that you can have a reasonable argument or fight with and then come back together soon, like that night or the next day, and you both come back and apologize and then rebuild that relationship. And then in the end, that relationship is like way stronger. I don't think I had that in my life. And I think growing up, I almost had the, I don't want to say the opposite, but there was a lot of repercussions for things like that that would go on for months and months. So I was almost taught to be scared of those things. And it almost has a, an abandonment feeling to it. Like, I think one thing that I really had to get over was this fear that people would abandon me if we had one fight. For whatever reason, that was like deep within me. And I think it's only the last few years that I've finally got rid of that. Like, I'm okay being myself. And if that makes somebody else upset, I'm not going to change myself to make them happy. If they are not okay with me, and they need to leave, then I need to let them. But if I have a disagreement with somebody who is still able to accept me for who I am, and you know later on we can patch things up, that's kind of the ultimate scenario for me in a relationship. I think communication is the basis of all relationships. And if you can communicate, you can really figure anything out. That's what I think. If you can communicate, you can figure out anything. If you can't communicate, all you're doing is putting band-aids on a, on a sinking ship, you know? You're not actually repairing the holes. So another thing with INFJs and relationships, I know I'm this way, and it might not be a positive thing. I think sometimes I can be kind of sensitive. And again, I think it's something that I've worked on really hard the last few years that I'm getting better at. But I think in the past, I was super sensitive, super almost thin skin. I, I could be offended easily, especially if someone insulted me. Even if it was a relationship I didn't value, I could still almost take their criticism to heart. And it's like you could have 10 compliments on something and then you have one critic. And that critic just wipes out the 10 positive comments or, or positive reinforcements you got. So I think I've come a long way in this department. I think again, this extroverted feeling and, you know, any personality that has extroverted feeling, like ESFJs have dominant extroverted feeling. So it's interesting, I've had, I have a few people in my life I've identified as ESFJ. And ESFJs, I mean, I'm just guessing just from the, the dominant function being extroverted feeling, but they must have a massive problem with people pleasing. INFJs have extroverted feeling in the second position in the stack. So that means we are quite susceptible to it maybe not as much as a dominant extroverted feeler, but very susceptible. 
Yeah, so I think that INFJs, and you might wanna watch my video on strengths and weaknesses of INFJs, but I think INFJs need confidence. And one thing that we really need to work on is remembering our value. And I, that's one thing I've really worked on because I think we can really slide into the whole worthlessness vibe quite quickly. It's one thing that I've really struggled with my whole life is you get one bad comment and you just slide into worthlessness, even though you've made something really great, let's say. Over the years, I've had to kind of reframe my thinking to expect negativity from a subset of people and almost reframe it to such a point that if I don't get negative comments, if I don't get thumbs downs on videos and people saying it sucked or people saying they don't agree with it, then I've really, I haven't pushed hard enough into the topic itself to actually create a bit of controversy. I think controversy is a sign that you are doing something worthwhile. Uh, you know, a lot of times I think our culture almost, like let's, let's say art. Art in, in history wasn't about entertainment so much as it is today. Art would push ideas forward. It wasn't always comfortable, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Whereas today we're almost, we look at art almost like entertainment. And so people, I think, make their art a little too safe. It's like that quote, art comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. If you think about your work that way, you're comforting some people, but other people will be unhappy or disturbed by it. So you gotta almost expect it and almost like look forward to it. Um, that's almost how I look at it now. So, you know, it still gets to me sometimes. I still am susceptible to that, but it's definitely something I'm working on hard all the time. So rug sweeping is a word that kind of describes some people's tendency to kind of push issues away and not talk about them. I am definitely not a rug sweeper. Um, I have had some people in my life that are rug sweepers. And it's really hard if you're a person that dislikes rug sweeping to hang out with rug sweepers. So what's an example of this? Somebody did a bunch of bad stuff, let's just say that. And there was this huge fight within the family. And all of a sudden then it was that person's birthday. I, I guess for me, I would rather fix the problem or discuss the issue before I move on to celebrating their birthday. Like, I, I just don't know how to do that. Like, if we're having a massive problem, how do we go and have a happy birthday party without first dealing with that issue? Um, yeah, I, I don't know, but I've noticed that some people will just sweep that under the rug and move on and act happy we're not talking about that anymore. And then, you know, maybe months later it might come out again. And it's just like these issues never get solved. So another thing I've noticed about myself, and I think this would be important to all INFJs, is we like to be kept in the loop without having to dig it out of people. I think this comes back to the whole feeling connected to a person. I think I operate best when people share themselves with me without having to dig it out. So I've noticed that closed off people, people that are closed off emotionally, they don't wanna expose their feelings, people that are closed off about their ideas, maybe people that are self-conscious about their ideas and just therefore don't talk about them. I have to ask a lot of questions to even get them to share with me. I have a hard time with these types of people because I feel like I'm left out of the loop a lot of the time. It's like something happens and I'm like, what? Like, why didn't you tell me about that? Like, why didn't you tell me you were feeling this way? Why didn't you tell me that you were thinking about this and we could have worked on it, right? I really value when somebody keeps me in the loop and it's like, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Hey, this is what I'm thinking. They come home and they share their day with me and you tell me their struggles, tell me their wins for the day. I think all these things go into creating healthy emotional intimacy creating acceptance, trust, feeling understood. You can't really trust a person if they don't share what's inside of them. And if you always are feeling like you're dragging, having to like pull things out of them. You know, I will tell you sort of one example. It's a close person in my life that I'm no longer really close with. I felt like this was going on. 
um, a romantic relationship, I was always, I felt forced to extract information because I just, I, there wasn't being shared with me. But then this person almost took it as a slight to them. She felt she was being interrogated. So that's what she would call it, like, why are you interrogating me? And <laughs> I would always respond, no, I'm not interrogating you. I'm, I'm trying to find out what you think about this, or I'm trying to get to the bottom of this issue, or say something happened and I didn't have enough details to really solve the problem, or, or let's say she doesn't like something that I'm doing, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of why she doesn't like that. Like, what emotion is she feeling in this situation? I felt like I was always trying to drag this out, and at the same time, she hated it. That was an awkward situation. I, it's really hard for me to exist in that situation. You know, that being said, I think sometimes, especially in relationships that are unhealthy, people begin to feel unsafe. So they don't feel safe to share their ideas, so therefore they don't share them. And if they do share their ideas, the other person might attack those ideas, right? And then, oh, they shut off, they don't share anymore. I think one of the, the most important things for creating open sharing and emotional intimacy is you have to be understanding and accepting of people and not ridicule this person's ideas. <sighs> However, I think there's another problem that kind of comes out of that. Sometimes people will share things that are wrong. They might be intellectually inaccurate. They might be accusatory. They might be manipulative. Um, anything that I would view as toxic. And at that point, you have no choice but to defend yourself or to try to correct that behavior. And I think that sometimes can be why these situations happen where this person sort of closes off. Anyway, all that to say that I like somebody who can keep me in the loop without me having to like drag that information out of them constantly. I, um, I find that really nice and restful and something that I'm looking for in all my relationships. So I touched on this already, but I'll talk about it a little bit more. You know, the thing about introverted intuition, which is the INFJ's dominant function. Introverted intuition loves progress. INFJs are finishers. So although we might sometimes be a little slow to start, once we start, it's like a freight train to finish these projects. And why is that? We love the feeling of progress. We love the feeling of working towards goals. We love improving. We love improving ourselves. We love improving others. We love improving our relationships. So when it comes to relationships, INFJs love movement. Not just working on myself and moving myself forward, but I like if this person is coming along with me together and we're improving ourselves by on our own, but we're also improving our relationship and deepening that connection and moving towards each other. If you look at kind of the building blocks of these relationships, there's certain personalities, about half the personalities, half the 16 personalities are the movement types and half of them are control types. So some people are more control orientated and they're less obsessed with progress. And usually those people, once they find something that works, they like to stick with it. And they just sort of go into maintenance mode. And if you're with a person like that, that treats your relationship like something that's working for them, it's good enough, and they're kind of just going into maintenance mode, I think for an INFJ that can be quite uncomfortable. And because we like progress, we don't want to go stagnant on anything. But meanwhile, the other person almost sees it as something that's secure and safe and almost something they can control and it's not getting away on them. If you have a person like that, and then you have a person that is constantly growing and you know, improving themselves, or let's say changing their values, you can end up with this situation where instead of two people kind of growing together, you end up with one person like veering off and they almost have no choice. They're going in this direction and exploring and learning and, and the other person just stays behind. I think that's a common way that relationships break down. Two people that they don't improve together. So that's another thing I think I value in a relationship is people that are willing to move forward, people that are willing to improve, people that are, you know, enjoy that self-improvement and progress. So one more thing that I wanted to talk about, 
is I often talk about almost like the downsides of extroverted feeling. I think it's because it's been one area that I've been really weak at and one area that's created a lot of struggle for me is the extroverted feeling. It's almost like runaway extroverted feeling and I can't, in the past, I haven't been able to control it and I become like the ultimate people pleaser. I'm just trying to make everybody else happy and I like almost sacrifice myself to make it happen. And so I think I'm naturally sort of just wired now to resist that. But, you know, I didn't really talk much about the positive sides of extroverted feeling in that last video. And I sort of, I wonder if I sounded a little cold and callous, I guess, towards extroverted feeling. But there's also a lot of benefits to extroverted feeling. It makes you able to connect with people. It makes you able to read people and read situations. Like, have you ever been with somebody who just almost seems, they're just almost like tone deaf to the appropriateness of a th something in a situation? I almost feel like narcissists are this way. They will say really strange things or do really strange things because it's almost like they can't gauge the appropriateness of an action in a situation. They're like, oh, in this situation, I should behave like this. So these things come out and they don't really seem genuine. So I, I kind of think that that's usually a lack of extroverted feeling. Extroverted feeling is quite good at this stuff. It makes knowing what other people are comfortable with, what other people want, quite intuitive. You can, and then along with your introverted intuition, it's quite easy to read people. So it's actually one of the strengths of an INFJ is reading people, gauging their feelings. I think a lot of times we sort of have a lot of ideas for people and that's probably why you kind of have that counselor stereotype as for INFJs, we can easily read a person and even if they're saying stuff, we can kind of read between the lines a lot of times and almost figure out what they're trying to say. I think unhealthy INFJs, again, this sort of goes into more of that paranoia side of things, they can make conclusions that aren't accurate. But I think a healthy INFJ can kind of combine all their functions, introverted intu intuition, extroverted feeling, uh, the introverted thinking, and then the fourth, which is the inferior function, is extroverted sensing, which is essentially, you know, observing the world around you. So a healthy INFJ will use all four of these things. And along with that whole progress thing, we want the whole world to experience progress. We're idealists. So we're in the idealist column. INFPs, INFJs, ENFPs, and ENFJs are all idealists. But INFJs sort of, I think, are a little special amongst the idealists in that they're really good at charting a course towards that ideal goal. Whereas some of the other personalities like an INFP, they have extroverted intuition instead of introverted intuition. And so they're very good at seeing the big picture. They see all the possibilities, but sometimes they can be a little slow to start. And, and, they, and even if they do start, they have a hard time finishing. That might be a, a struggle of INFP, I think ENFPs as well, is they almost get so caught up in all the possibilities that they could be doing that they have a really hard time sort of focusing on one thing. So I think INFJs, we're really good at focusing on one thing and doing that. So when you kind of combine this with the extroverted feeling and um, you're trying to basically create a better world for people. and extroverted feeling is sort of a key part of that. For me, I think it's my Achilles heel. And so that's why I'm always talking about these ways to almost tone it down, not let it run wild. And um, it's just funny because when it's healthy, it also can be an INFJ's almost greatest strength. It, it's the thing that allows you to connect with other people in such a deep level because you can actually read people and you can be very aware of another person's state. So in a relationship, that can be a great advantage. Like in my friends, if something's bothering them, like I immediately know. And I have one friend in particular and she says, you know, I'm not used to somebody being so perceptive about my emotional state. And so I, I'm used to being able to hide this better, but you see right through it and I can't hide it from you so, and meanwhile, I'm just like, well, 
seems obvious. Like it's like, so that's why a lot of things that I think INFJs are really good at just seem so obvious. And as a result, we're looking around and we're going, uh, hello, why doesn't anybody else notice this? This doesn't make sense or this, this is what's happening here. Um, can't you see it? <laughs> and other people can't see it. You know, other people have other advantages, you know, things that we can't see or do. And everybody is just a little different. You know, another thing that I, I probably should mention before the end is I don't want to come across like INFJs are this completely different breed of human being. I think all human beings are very similar and then we have these subtle differences in how we interact with the world. So an INFP and an INFJ, there's some differences for sure. But there's also, there's almost like there's more in common than there is different. I think we are quite unique in a lot of ways for good and for bad. That, that can come out in good ways, that can come out in bad ways. But it's not like we're aliens. Um, we're not aliens. We have more in common with other people than we think sometimes. So I guess as a final encouragement, I hear in the comments from a lot of INFJs that you know they don't have friends. I, it's a common thing for INFJ, INFJs to say is that you know I don't have any friends. Here's the thing. If you are one of those people that feels like you don't have that friendship that you want or need, you just might need to work on it with some new people and you need to find those people. Sometimes your existing relationships, you might need to relax on those people and move forward into finding some new people. And sometimes people ask me, well, where do you find these friends? To be honest, I think the best place to find these people is in groups like sports related things or art related things. So it's like two areas that I'm kind of heavily involved in. I do a lot of rock climbing is where I have found a couple really good friends. And same with, um, I do a lot of kite surfing actually, kiteboarding, kite surfing on the lake here or on uh, in the ocean. And it's funny how you can find like-minded people in those groups or um, also like the photography and filmmaking communities. It's somewhere where I've basically can find like-minded people. But I think with INFJs, a lot of times it's almost like the friends that we end up with, if we're just being lazy, it's almost like people adopt us. And then all of a sudden we have this friend and later on we're like, well, I've been friends with this person for five years, but why? Why am I even friends? And if you think about it, it's because they adopted you. They're like, hey, come out with us. And you're like, oh, okay, and you go. I think that if we wanna find those true deep connections, it's almost like we gotta find those people and we have to initiate it. Like, we, like there's a person I'd like to be friends with and work towards it. Don't just work on the friendships where th those other people make it easy and they adopt you. They ask you out once a week, so you go because you feel bad saying no with your extroverted feeling. And now you end up as a friend. Um, you have the power to seek those people out and initiate those relationships yourself. So just something to keep in mind. I think it's possible for us to build the relationships that we really want. And I have a couple of those in my life now. And I've had to let a lot of relationships go, to be honest. People that I thought were my friends weren't my friends. I went through some hard times letting all that go. But I think in the end, I'm a much stronger person for it. Don't be a people pleaser. Don't let people manipulate you. That's really important. Anyway. Hope you enjoyed the video. I feel like I rambled a bit. Um, a lot of that, it was just completely anecdotal opinion-based information about INFJs, and uh, I hope you get something out of it. I think INFJs in general, it's not natural for us to leave comments a lot of times. I know I don't. I don't often leave comments, but I'm trying to. If there's a video that I really like or somebody does something that I really enjoy, I'm trying to tell them recently. Leave a comment below, introduce yourself. Um, maybe you'll meet some people that you want to talk with and get to know better. All right, thanks. Talk to you later. Have a great day.